Hi everyone, so today we're going to be talking about the Bayesian Lemma and the Fermat's Little Theorem. Now these are two like elementary concepts in number theory, but they keep coming up a lot in all of these contest exams. So yeah, let's see how this goes. This is a problem number three from the Hong Kong Math Olympiad in the year 2000. And in this video, we're going to be looking at Fermat's Little Theorem and divisibility. Basically, we're going to convert this problem into a divisibility problem. And um, after that, we're going to look at Bayesian's Lemma and its generalization. After that, we have certain book sessions from National Math Olympiads, and at the end, a similar but challenging problem. This video is sponsored by Chinta.com. Since 2010, Chinta has trained thousands of students from all around the world in mathematical Olympiads, physics Olympiads, computer science and informatics Olympiads, ISI CMI entrances, and research projects for school and college students. Okay, great. So the goal is to find all primes p and q such that 7 raised to the power p minus 2 raised to the power p times 7 raised to the power q minus 2 raised to the power q divided by pq is an integer. So basically, you need to solve this kind of diaphantine, right? So this entire thing needs to be an integer. Let's call that integer k, you know, for whatever that may be. Now, essentially, if this has to be an integer, that essentially implies that pq needs to divide this quantity. Right, 7 raised to the power p minus 2 raised to the power p times 7 raised to the power q minus 2 raised to the power q. Right? And p and q are primes. Right? Prime, prime is p and q. And prime, like the minimum prime is 2, and then we have all odd primes. So 2 is the only even prime. But regardless, if p and q are both primes, then I can just divide this into two cases very conveniently. The case 1 will be that p divides 7 raised to the power p minus 2 raised to the power p. And the other case would be that p divides this other quantity. Whereas we can just conveniently divide this into two cases and then we can just analyze each of them uh, one by one. Now before I maybe like jump onto this case, let me just discuss the Fermat's theorem a little bit. And in short, let me just call that as FLT. Okay, great. So what does FLT state? So it states that for co-prime integers P and A, so GCD of P and A is 1. So for co-prime integers p and a, we have this relation a raised to the power p minus 1 is congruent to 1 modulo p. Okay. This is essentially for a little theorem. It's actually very, very useful in elementary number theory problems. And, you know, equivalently, I can write a raised to the power p is congruent to a mod p. Right. And this is a special case of the Euler's torsion theorem. Right. Let me just like note that down as well. Euler's torsion theorem, which basically says that a raised to the power phi of n is congruent to 1 mod n and phi of n is obviously the Euler's torsion function but okay anyways for the purpose of this problem we only need FLT so a raised to the power p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod n mod not p I'm sorry where p is a prime okay let me just put that in p is prime and basically for primes p phi of p is p minus 1 so if you just put that in the Euler's torsion theorem you'll get the same relation but okay for primes, basically all the torsion theorem is for Maslow theorem. So a raised to the power p is congruent to a mod p for prime p. And, and it's a good thing because in this question, they have given us primes p and q. Also, the number 7 and the number 2, both of these are primes. So really, for Maslow theorem, you kind of get the intuition that somewhere or the other, probably for Maslow theorem is going to be used. But okay, anyways, just continuing on our case. So we were discussing the case where p divides 7 raised to the power p minus 2 raised to the power p. So effectively, 7 raised to the power p minus 2 raised to the power p is congruent to 0 mod p, right? Because p divides this quantity. So 7 raised to the power p is congruent to 2 raised to the power p mod p. Okay, great. Uh, now what can we do? So maybe by Fermat's little theorem, I can just state that 7 raised to the power p is actually congruent to 7 mod p because p is prime, right? From this relation over here, I just put a is equal to 7 into this. Great. And from Fermat's little theorem, I can also state that 2 raised to the power p is congruent to um, 2 mod p. Great. So effectively, 7 raised to the power p minus 2 raised to the power p is congruent to 7 minus 2, which is 5 mod p. But really, here we can see that 7 raised to the power p minus 2 raised to the power p is 0 mod p. So which implies 5 is congruent to 0 mod p. And therefore, p is 5. And why did I say that? Because really, because the only prime p such that when divided by 5, you get the remainder of 0 is 5. There are no other primes, 2, 3, 7, 10, no. 
So yeah, anyway, so 5 is congruent to 0 mod p. That means the uh, prime p when divided by 5, it leaves even to 0. So effectively, p has to be equal to 5. And now after this, we do nothing. We just plug it into the equation, right? So basically, we have 7 to the power 5 minus 2 to the power 5 divided by 5 times 7 to the power q minus 2 to the power q divided by q. And this effectively needs to be an integer. So when I maybe like simplify this down a little bit, this thing can be reduced to 5 times 11 times 61 times 7 to the power q minus 2 to the power q divided by q. Okay, great. Now q can also very easily be 5, 11 or 61. Right, because q is a prime and all the three numbers are prime. So if q is 5, 11 or 61, then this quantity is obviously an integer. So therefore we get a certain set of solutions and p is obviously 5. So we get 5, 5, 5 we get 5 comma 11 and we get 5 comma 61 but that's done for that at least now what if q divides this this big this other thing over here right what if q divides 7 this per q minus 2 this per q well we actually already seen that because we've seen the case that p divides 7 this per p minus 2 this per p and we get that p is equal to 5 so by symmetry we can actually say that q is also equal to 5 from this because if we can just do this you can just state that 7 this per q minus 2 this per q is congruent to 0 mod q and then you can use fermat's little theorem to state that 7 this per q is congruent to 7 mod q and 2 this per q is congruent to 2 mod q just subtract this you'll get 5 is congruent to 0 mod q and therefore q is equal to 5. This is like quick uh, recap of what we did earlier. So q is equal to 5 but q is equal to 5 we've already considered that right? So we don't need to consider q is equal to 5 again. So 5 comma 5, 5 comma 11, 5 comma 61 are the solutions for this case. Is that correct? Not quite. Because you see the equation is symmetric. The equation, the original equation 7 to the power p minus 2 to the power p times 7 to the power q minus 2 to the power q to the power p q. This is exactly symmetric. If I replace p by q and q by p, I will still get the same equation. So the equation is effectively symmetric, right? So therefore, if p comma q is a solution, that implies q comma p is also a solution. So 5 comma 5, 5 comma 11, 5 comma 61 were the solution that we had obtained. Similarly, 11 comma 5 and 61 comma 5 will also be the solutions. So for this case, case number one, we have five solutions in total. Let's move on to case number two. Case number two was when p divides 7 raised per q minus 2 raised per q. Okay, great. And I'm just going to divide this into maybe like two subcases. So subcase one and subcase two. So subcase one is going to be where the GCD of p minus 1 and q is not equal to 1. Now keep in mind that p and q are primes. Right, so the idea is that, for example, uh, let's say p and q are primes. Right, so for example, let them be twenty-three and twenty-nine. For instance, just like if I just try to analyze them. So maybe this is p and this is q. So what is p minus one? Just twenty-two and twenty-nine, and obviously the GCD of this is one. So you can kind of get the idea that for most cases, the GCD of p minus one and q is going to be one. And in fact, the only case where this is not equal to one is p is equal to three and q is equal to two. Because here p minus 1 is 2 and q is 2 and the GCD of these two quantities is actually 1. So there's only one case where this is not equal to 1, where the GCD is not equal to 1. This is 2, I'm sorry. And that is when p is 3, q is 2. And all you really need to do is you just need to plug this in into original equation, what was given to us. And this needs to be an integer, but when you plug 3, 2 over here, you see that this is not an integer. Right, so this solution does not work because when you plug it in, you'll actually get that it's not an integer. But okay, anyways, let's move on to subcase number two. So subcase number two is when the GCD of p minus one and q is equal to one, which is which is for most other primes. Now here it's worthwhile to discuss the Bayes' lemma, right? So what does the Bayes' lemma states? It states that there exists integers a comma b. Such that ax plus by is the GCD of x comma y. And this essentially is nothing but like a result of the Euclidean division algorithm. Just keep on repeating the EDA, you'll get this result. But there, there exists a, like a nice generalization of this. So this is Bezos' uh, lemma for two integers, right? For two integers, we're considering x comma y. I can actually generalize this to n integers. So generalization is actually quite interesting. So if the GCD of maybe let's say a1, a2, a3, all the way up to an, if that is d, 
then I can state that there exists integers x1 comma x2 all the way up to xn such that d is the linear combination of them so a1 x1 plus a2 x2 all the way up to a n xn right so effectively this is essentially saying that the linear combination of any two numbers can be represented in the form of the gcd something like that right so this is a generalization of the basis lemma now for the purpose of this problem we we just need two numbers right because we have only two numbers over here so gcd of p minus one and q is equal to one so i can just write that a times p minus one plus q times let's say b is equal to one and because a and b are integers minus a will also be an integer and b is obviously an integer is equal to one if I maybe just make BQ the subject, I'll get BQ is equal to 1 plus A times P minus 1. Okay, great. So for this case, we were discussing P divided 7 raised to the power Q minus 2 raised to the power Q, right? So 7 raised to the power Q minus 2 raised to the power Q is congruent to 0 modulo P. Okay, great. That implies that 7 raised to the power P is congruent to 2 raised to the power Q mod P. We're dealing with Qs right now. And over here, we have BQ, so might as well just raise this to the power Q, right? To the power b, I'm sorry. So 7 raised to the power bq is congruent to 2 raised to the power bq modulo p. Okay, great. And if I just write bq is equal to this quantity, I'll actually get 7 times 7 raised to the power p minus 1 raised to the power a is congruent to 2 times 2 raised to the power p minus 1 raised to the power a modulo p. And after this, all I really need to do, I just need to apply for Marcel theorem one more time. So 7 raised to the power p minus 1 is actually congruent to 1 mod p. And similarly, 2 raised to the power p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p. So this becomes 1 mod p, this becomes 1 mod p, and 1 raised to the power a is obviously 1. So that essentially becomes 7 times 1 raised to the power a is congruent to 2 times 1 raised to the power a modulo p. So effectively, if I just bring this 2 to the other side, we get 5 is congruent to 0 modulo p. So which implies that p is equal to 5, but we don't need to talk about that because we've already considered that before. We already considered all the... Uh, solution that we can get when p is equal to 5 when we discuss that over here and we essentially just plug that into the equation and worked around with that so therefore the solutions this no this does not have any additional solutions so therefore the only solutions are from case 1 and they were 5 comma 5 5 comma 11 5 comma 61 and they are uh, uh their, their permutations right so 11 comma 5 and 61 comma 5 so we have five solutions in total so yes, that was a quite an interesting problem and we learned a couple of things. Application of Fermat's little theorem and Bezos' lemma. Two quite simple things, but when you combine them, you can actually uh, form a pretty good problem. Moving on, we have sent book suggestions for National Math Olympians, Elementary Number Theory by David Burton, Principles and Techniques in Combinatorics, Problem Solving Strategies by Arthur and Jell, Functional Equations by Venkatachala, Problems in Plane Geometry by Sharigan, and Elementary Number Theory by Sierpinski. Okay, so at the end, we have a similar but challenging problem and we need to find all primes p comma q that satisfy this given equation, right? p raised to the power of 4 plus p squared plus n is q cubed. Now, the hint that I would probably give is just factorize it. Because once you factorize it, things become a little bit easier to note down. And then you can maybe use some ideas of divisibility for mass little theorem and go on about that. Because whenever you see primes p and q, you should have the idea in the back of your mind that maybe for mass little theorem can be applied over here. So anyways, maybe try that out and if you're able to solve it, leave me in the comment section and until then, I'll see you in the next video. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. The programs are designed for students who are passionate about mathematics and they are personalized with one-on-one -on -one training, individual evaluation and remedial sessions. The reason Chinta students are successful over the last 10 years because they are taught by mathematicians and real Olympiads from leading universities in India, United States and Europe. Some of our students come back to teach at Chinta from Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, MIT, UCLA, ISI, CMI, IITs, TIFR and IISC. For more information, visit Chinta.com.